Are you tired of self-doubt holding you back? Have you ever wished you could have the confidence to face your fears, go after your wildest dreams, and the tools necessary to live your best life? Hey there, amazing listeners. I'm your host and author of How to Grasp Confidence and Own Your Power, and I've made it my mission to help you break free from self-doubt and embrace confidence. Subscribe now and join us as we unlock the secrets to unshakable self-assurance. Let's dive in. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Grasp Confidence Podcast. I am your host, Tara LaFon Gooch, and this is a different podcast based on confidence than other things out there. And I can say that because of two reasons. Number one, we go really, really deep into the subject of confidence and personal development. This is not just scratching the surface and giving generic advice. This is giving deep and profound truths that help you elevate yourself and live your best, most confident life. The other reason this show is so great is because I interview, and I'm so lucky and grateful and fortunate to, interview the best people in the world, the top experts, people that help guide us on our journeys of confidence. And today's new different. So I want to introduce my next guest and tell you a little bit about her journey and how she can help you guide yours. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Andrea Vitz. I'm an emotional sobriety expert. I developed emotional sobriety training via a curriculum called the You You've Never Met. I'm an executive coach. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. And I am also a doctor of chiropractic for two decades. Uh, My real mission in life is to help people overcome their emotional overwhelm, their emotional addiction, and their um, ability to even have their emotions take over them or hijack them in the first place. So it makes them just better leaders, more stable human beings, and really teach people like an expedited maturity that they didn't even notice that they weren't tapped into. Oh my, there's a lot going on there. Emotional sobriety. I've never heard of that word. That's so fascinating. Um, It's very interesting. I'd like to hear a little bit more about it. How did you come to this specific emotional sobriety? What does that even mean? Well, I recognized a long time ago um, that there was there was more to just, you know, anxiety, depression, um, constant fighting in relationships and things like that. Just studying the human experience. I really think of myself as like a human expert. Right. So everywhere you go, there's humans. and, And when you recognize that your emotions continuously come back and they come back and it's really our thoughts that anchor our emotions. And so I recognize, well, emotions. And so we could absolutely get addicted to our chemistry. And that doesn't mean we like it. It just means that our body becomes predisposed to making it. Even if we don't have something happen in our lives. I mean, you can wake up with anxiety. Why? Nothing happened. So you would then have to recognize the chemical was already being made in your body and you woke up and maybe you matched it with the thought or maybe you didn't and you were just experiencing the chemical. And so the idea of removing the emotional addiction brought me to the word sobriety. Mm. And I thought, and I thought, wow, it's emotional sobriety. And then I found that emotional sobriety is actually something that's been talked about for, I don't know, the last 60 years. It's something that um, the founders of AA let's just call him out. Bill Wilson said that he feared the 12 steps wouldn't be enough and that what we really needed was emotional sobriety. And I know what he was saying there because he never developed anything surrounding what it specifically was or how to get it. But it was toward, I think, the end of his life that he mentioned this. And so it was really for the next step or the next people to come in and pioneer. And I recognized, okay, that was obviously my calling. I was supposed to have this download of information about what emotional sobriety truly is and how to attain it because it really isn't enough just to be emotionally intelligent you have to get to a place where the emotion itself doesn't even enter into your system and the only way we can do that is through specific training to change our personality to change 
the way that we react to things, to change the way that we think. And when we shift our perspective, we don't make the same emotions we used to make. And we're from a complete, we come from a completely different place at that point. We present as completely different people and we have complete leadership over our lives, which makes us better leaders in general. Well, what you're describing is, is the foundation, you know, and, and a lot of people, um, to your point, you know, we sometimes think we need one thing, right? But we actually need another. And in order for us to get to that ne next level of our journey, whatever that is, if we're trying to be a better leader for our team at work or a better leader for ourselves or better just mom and human being, right? Yes. There's these foundational things that we need to work on. And this goes for anybody, right? But as I would think especially somebody that, as you talked about, is waking up anxious. Mm -hmm. And when you said that, it really, really resonated with me. I actually got goosebumps because it wasn't so long ago I felt that way too. And I think a lot of people are waking up this way, crying in the shower to hide it right? And on the surface, maybe they seem fine. But these emotions that we're experiencing are kind of almost anchoring us to a place we don't want to be anymore. Yeah. What do you think about that? I 100% agree with you. I think every single human being has an addiction to at least one emotional state that they've relived over and over again since they were very little. And the way that I think this happens is it's something called that I call the anatomy of the of emotional insobriety. And so it's the anatomy. It's the things that make up your specific insobriety. So that would look like your trauma or past experiences or conditioning that you've ex that you've had in your life that have imprinted in your brain as truth. So that could be you're not lovable. You're not important. You're never going to be good enough. You are a yeah. joke. You're going to be betrayed. Fill in the blank there, <laughs> okay? Everybody has one or several, but they're not always exactly the same. And so I want to give space for people to find their specific one and, and put it in there. Now, recognizing too that this belief that you have from this trauma, right, will then become a filter through which you look at the world. Every single interaction, every single experience you have is filtered through that filter of I'm not important, I'm not good enough, I'm not loved, I'm a joke. I'm going to be betrayed. Mm -hmm. And so when that happens, you can find evidence of your belief everywhere. And that is the scary thing because now what seems like a different situation is not really a different in sobriety. It's a different situation, same in sobriety. Wow. Right? And here's the kicker. Once that belief is seemingly validated, we're okay. flooded with the chemistry, the chemistry of our past. We're flooded with the same chemistry that came from our initial traumatic experience that we've practiced over and over and over and over again. So our body became addicted to making it. So that same flood of the same anxiety, the same embarrassment, the same resentment, the same offendability, the shock, the sadness, whatever is your specific flavor of emotional addiction is always present with you until you catch it and take full responsibility for your chemistry. Now, your emotional state dictates the quality of your life. It's it's not an arguable fact. Your emotional right. state dictates the quality of your life. And what controls how you feel controls you. That's why advertising works. Yes. <laughs> what yes. Controls, what controls you. So wouldn't you then want complete ownership over what controls the quality of your life. Yeah. Because what happens when I'm flooded with that chemistry or when we are flooded with that chemistry is we become intoxicated because chemistry is a toxin usually. And that toxin makes us intoxicated. No different than if I drink a 12 pack of beer, I'm not going to be me after that. Everything I say and do after that is coming from a very deep rooted subconscious traumatically influenced space. And so I'm going to behave in ways I'd never consciously choose. I'm going to be defensive. I'm going to be childish. I'm going to be jealous. I'm going to be judgmental. I'm going to be, I'm going to be dishonest. I'm going to reach for booze. I'm going to reach for drugs. I'm going to act compulsively in some way, in some variation of this, we all do it. And those behaviors are the things that would 
you know, label us as narcissistic or abusive or, you know, terrible leaders. And they get us in trouble. And the, we're either hurting other people or we're hurting ourselves in those moments. And I call those emotionally triggered behaviors. So that's kind of the anatomy that makes up your insobriety or what we could call your intoxicated identity, the version of you that isn't really you. And it all stems from your chemical state. Fascinating. And I know this is 100% true because I've been through this. And um, it was earlier this year, a friend of mine, Tracy Clark, um, we went through limiting beliefs. And uh, it was sh I was a little shocked because my limiting belief was that I don't deserve love. Now, this is a common thing. It sounds really harsh when I say it out loud. And it sounds like, oh my gosh, Tara, of course you deserve love, right? Why would you even have that limiting belief? Obviously, this came from somewhere and a seed was planted, right? And it became a belief system. But this, how has this impacted me throughout my whole life? It's caused me to probably show up a lot differently. It's probably caused me to not go after bigger goals and dreams and aspirations. It's probably caused me to sit back when I should have been at the front. So these limiting beliefs, at, to your point, if they're not addressed, we don't, we don't understand they're there. And then we allow ourselves to keep, it's like almost like you're, you're marinating, right? I think of like a, a turkey being basted in the oven. It's like you're taking a marinade. And you're putting it back on the turkey and you're drenching that turkey in the continuous sauce, right? You're it, And it eventually creates this reality that you now live in. But also, I think, yeah, we're hurting others with it, but we're also hurting your, ourselves, too, because it's killing our own potential. And then it's causing us to not show up the way we intend. Tara, you're saying exactly my same language. I talk about how we marinate in our trauma. We marinate in our emotions. And yeah. what that really is, what you're saying is we're training. Mm. We're always training. This is a very secret fundamental that we teach at Lifted Academy, is that you're always, in fact, training. You're training when you're sitting on the couch. You're training to sit on the couch. When you're yelling at your kids, you're training to yell at your kids. When you're eating junk food, you're training to eat junk food. When you choose something really positive and healthy, you're training to choose something positive and healthy. And so... You're talking about repetitive, rep-based training of in the negative or in the self-destructive arena. And I love that you're bringing this up because really our, our self-consciousness, our self-centeredness, and it's not the same as selfishness, everyone, so don't freak out. Your self-centeredness is when you're trapped, I think of it as when you're trapped inside of you mm -hmm. and everything around you is about you. It's about your unlovability. It's about your not good enoughness. And until you start leaping over those beliefs and actually taking action and demonstrating in the opposite, ignoring them completely and saying enough, you know, jumping into like an alter ego state, like the, literally the alternate to your ego. <laughs> if you jump over those beliefs and you start proving the opposite, what you're doing is you're training a new belief. Yeah. And you put, reps in, you put reps exactly. in and then that belief becomes now it's a different reality. And, you know, and that's how you change because we're not, we're not planted. We're not trees. We're not fixed. We can move. A lot of yes. people think this is me. This is how it always will be. But in reality, it's just a matter of taking action, replacing those bad habit habits, marinating behaviors with something different, with a change something positive in a right direction. Um, and, you know, it's very common, I feel like, with anybody, but is it more common with a certain type of people or is it more common with women, would you say? Or is this kind of common with anybody? Any human. Yeah. Any human. We're all the same. I say that a thousand times every time I teach a class. We're all the same. And that offends a lot of people because they like to feel like not superior. Some people do. It makes them feel comfortable. But I think a lot of people believe like who's hurt them is, is worse than them or who's hurt someone else is worse than them. But when I say we're all the same, what I'm saying is 
we all have the exact same anatomy that makes up our insobriety. And though that insobriety causes us to behave in ways we never consciously choose, which hurt us or other people. And so when you recognize that your mechanism for being abusive or your mechanism for making a mistake is the exact same as everybody that came before you and everybody that will come after you, it creates a level of humility. And the humility, not like self-deprecation or, oh, I'm not good enough, but like a, wow, we're just, we're balanced. Everybody has the same opportunity to experience this and to overcome it. I love that because it's empowering. And that's what I, you know, those are the exact type of messages I like to teach on this show is that, you know, the sucky part is, is that sometimes bad things have happened to you. Um, And that's not your fault. But how we react to them, you know, and and if we choose to stay in it there, well, we we can also make that same empowering choice to choose not to stay there. Right. And it's it's giving the power back to ourselves because sometimes somebody may have tried to take away our power. Right. Oh, yeah. The majority of the time. That's what happens. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and it's it's not your fault when these things happen. Nobody's blaming you, but take your power back. And it's possible, right? Um, you know, it's so unbelievable because I think there's so many people out there with just immense, immense potential. But, you know, going back to these limiting beliefs, they're holding so many people back. And it's incredible to me because... I've seen people from all walks of life, industries, disciplines, uh, educational levels, get really held back by these beliefs. Right. So I'm wondering from you, because you're the expert, how does one come, I guess the first step is realization that these beliefs are there, would you say, or is there something different? Yeah, I call it the 4A formula. And what mm-hmm. that is, awareness, first step, very important. You can't edit what you don't see. Right. So those blind spots, the victimhood has to be looked at and just right in the face. You got to corner it and say, I see you. (laughs) Then we acknowledge exactly and precisely how that anatomy of emotional insobriety, how our insobriety has actually created havoc in our lives. We have to look at the specifics. Okay. In this relationship, how did you show up in these ways? And in this conversation, what could you have done differently that wasn't in alignment with what you would have chosen. If you weren't emotional in that moment, would you have more clarity? Would you have in fact not been drunk on emotion and able to make a new decision? And when you see it in your face, how your in sobriety has affected every decision, every relationship, every outcome, it's affected you financially. It's affected you in love. It's affected in how affecting you, how you parent and in your friendships, when you see it, it should instill in you a moment of that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. And so that third A is called action, which I know you're all all about, Tara. It's like, what are we doing? Take action. Yes, we feel that our power has been taken away from us, but what does that actually mean? It means that something outside of you is controlling how you feel inside of you. That's what it means to give your power away, by the way. That's That's a, I want to shine some light and directly define what that is. If I'm allowing my emotional state to change because of something you've said to me, then I'm giving you my power or something that you've done to me. I'm giving you my power. But what you said earlier is people may have tried to take your power away. Well, yeah, people that don't believe in their own power attempt to take other people's power and they do it by changing the way they feel. So when you have all of your power, you know that you're good enough. You know that you're that you're loved. You know that you're important and that you're valuable and you've earned it. You've earned self-esteem and self-trust and self-respect. When you've earned that, you don't ever take anyone else's power. You would never even think of it. You would only want to empower other people because of that humility and that courage that you've developed in your process of taking action. And then that fourth A is application. It's applying and demonstrating 
the new version of you so many times, repetition, so many times that that now becomes your default state. You're now behaving in a chosen space, a non-emotionally reactive space, maybe 90% of the time, whereas before it was maybe two. Believe it or not, right? The majority of the time we're, we are living our life based on our emotional state. And we're so used to how we feel that we don't even notice that it's not healthy. I often say that it's common and it's normal doesn't mean it's healthy. And that's one of the ways that I recognized I was emotionally unsober myself in the past because, oh my God, everyone around me, even in movies and TV shows and songs, in circles, in even professional settings, people were gossiping. They were angry. They were offended. They were lying. They were drinking. They were doing drugs. They Everyone was the same in that they all had some form of emotional insobriety, a behavior that was coming from an emotional trigger. Yes. Yes. So much wisdom in that. And I agree with every single point. And, you know, going back uh, to the, the beginning, I'm a really big advocate that you can't manage what you can't measure. You have to acknowledge these things, right? And it's okay. Get, 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 listen, everybody, no one here is perfect and nobody expects you to be. And these things that are these emotional anchors in your life that feel like, you know, they're steering the ship, stop giving them that power. We can change these things, right? Yeah. But first we have to acknowledge that they're there because we can't manage something we don't acknowledge. Um, and then absolutely, you know, to your point, we have to take action. Um, I, you just brought up a huge thing that I'm a big believer in as well, that, yeah, while a lot of this is an inside game, guess what? <laughs> your cir circle, those who you surround yourself with, your environment, if your environment is not conducive for your growth, for where you're going, it it's going to be really hard for you to keep this action in place because we can only move so far if we're constricted from our surroundings on the outside. So it's a, it's a holistic thing we're talking about. It's internal, but also our environment external as well. Cause I do think like energy attracts like energy and your point, you know, we're seeing our environment. Is that a reflection of us? Yeah, it's a mirror of exactly where you're at. And that's why, like, I love, again, we're totally synced up, but the yep. familiar, I would call that the familiar energy or the familiar mm -hmm. energy crisis. So someone that's doing training with me, that's really taking steps to change and they're really doing it, can be very quickly pulled back by entering back into familiar circles. And that could be like your growing up family, your siblings, your parents, romantic relationships are the hardest place to change within doesn't mean it's impossible. In fact, if you can grow and, and adapt and change inside of a long-term romantic relationship, you are doing the heaviest lifting. So you're going to be one of the strongest people. Okay. Because there's so much in there that there's pre-sobriety agreements. There's unspoken agreements of who you're supposed to be in that relationship and what you do together and how you talk and how you feel. So if yeah. you're sharing offendability, if you're sharing outrage, if you're sharing embarrassment, then you're going to rock the boat in that relationship when you start to choose more. And you're going to feel sucked back. So it's our job to not come out with like guns blazing saying, I'm going to be different and so are you. It's no, I'm going to just change with love and with grace and I'm going to like lovingly invite the people to just kind of with me. And they don't have to come with me. I'm still going to love them. But I have to make sure that I'm always strong enough to be in that relationship before I can enter into it again. So that might take a couple months. It might take a couple of years. But you have to be able to set very clear boundaries. Now, when I say boundaries, I don't mean like never talk to me again. I mean... If you think of a boundary, it's just space between two things. It's like if you go to a bar, that's a that's a barrier. That's a boundary. 
there's a bartender, there's space between you and the bartender that you can't cross, right? There's you. And so that could be the same in relationships. You could have a boundary with somebody right in front of their face. That's just this small space that says, hey, here's an area that we can't go to together. I love you and I want to I want to have all these experiences with you, but this right here doesn't work for me. And it's love. And I'm telling you that because I love you, because I want to keep the relationship. I think a huge problem is that when people set boundaries, the person who takes the boundary feels like it's an I don't love you or a criticism when really it's an invitation to let me love you more. Yes. See, that is so powerful. And I'll admit, I have not been the best at that in, in the past, you know, because my personality, I can be a little bit of a bull, right? So if I identify somebody, <laughs> some people are listening to this saying, oh, yeah, that was me. No, I'm just kidding. But I sometimes, you know, I, I identify somebody and I know that they're it, maybe it's a boundary crossing issue. And I tend to, I tend to just put up a wall and I don't necessarily mean to do that. It's not, um, it's not that I don't love that person, but I, it's a protection of energy. Um, but there's nicer ways, of course, we can go about things, right? To still love that other person and make sure that we communicate that, Hey, I love you. I wish, wish you the best and I need this. And maybe with this, we can grow together. Would that work? And you're inviting that person on, on your growth journey at that point. And maybe they're interested enough that they want to proceed in going a growth journey. And maybe, maybe these things are things they haven't even acknowledged or identified of themselves. Yes. One of the things that I help my students and clients do is when they're setting boundaries, instead of saying, I need you to. I often say something like, hey, I'm really working on not gossiping anymore. And I really need you to help me with that. I really need you to help me be accountable. Can you do that for me? And you're not saying, hey, we need to stop gossiping. You're not saying you need to stop gossiping because I've stopped. You're saying I need help. I need help in being different. It's no different than like if you're drinking too much and all your friends are drinking. You wouldn't go to your friends and say, all of you need to stop drinking because I've decided to stop drinking. It's you guys... Being humble, being humble and vulnerable here, I'm going to quit drinking and I need help because I'm addicted to drinking or I'm addicted to gossiping or I'm addicted to being defensive, right? I'm addicted to being depressed. I'm addicted to being anxious. I'm addicted to being embarrassed and offended. I'm just going to tell you exactly where I'm at. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be vulnerable and courageous. So everyone in my life understands what my intention is. And then they feel like, wow, now I have a part in this. I'm not causing her problems. She's taking responsibility for her problems, but I'm helping her. It's like a new mm -hmm. purpose. And sometimes that inspires them to do the same thing. Like, you know what? I'm going to quit drinking too. You know what? I'm going to quit being defensive too. Or yeah, I don't like gossiping. Why do we do that? Yeah. I just, I've always done it. So it's, it's really letting your, flaunting your failures is like the number one hack, if you will, to confidence. Mm. That's a secret that I don't want to share. It's authentic. Yeah. And it's 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 a it's a humility approach. Like going to people, um, there's a saying in business, if you ask someone for advice, or pardon me, if you ask someone for money, they give you advice. But if you ask someone for advice, they give you money. <laughs> Have you ever heard that? <laughs> no, but it's fantastic. And it's true, right? So, and we immediately relate to that because everybody's had us ask us for money and we were like repelled, repelled by it. We're like, oh God, let me give you advice. You flip the script and you ask someone for advice and all of a sudden you start getting interest in the business you're in, right? And the same thing in our healing journey. Again, bringing people with you, not repelling them, not saying, listen, hey, I'm doing this. Good luck. Uh, I can't be with you anymore. Uh, God bless. Instead saying, I love your approach, by the way. Hey, I'm working on this. This is really important to me. Um, can you help? Can you help me? Can we do this? Maybe we could do this together. Yeah. Maybe we can. Um, and that sounds so much better than what I used to do. 
<laughs> We've all done it. Flaunt that as a failure. I do it all the time. Where were you a couple years ago when I was burning bridges? I don't know. Um, but yeah, flaunting our failures and not being perfect because nobody wants to hang around somebody that's perfect. Well, and there's it's an unattainable fake illusion. You know, yeah. perfection does not, it's so subjective. And your version of perfect, I can guarantee you, is surrounding the theme of your self-beliefs. So if I believe that I'm not good enough, then I have to be perfect at all the things in order to be good enough. Yeah. Okay. If I believe I'm not lovable, then I have to be loved by everybody mm. in order to be perfect. That is impossible. Yep. If I'm not important, I have to be important to everyone and about everything. And that's just an impossible feat. And so most of the time when people say I'm, I'm perfectionist or I want to be perfect or I'm never going to be perfect, it's like, yeah, you're, you're not because there's no such thing. It's made up in your head of what that looks like. And every time you get close to what you think of as perfect, you're going to move the target because you still believe you're not good enough. So you'll find the next thing that you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. See, I'm not good enough. And so confidence really, I believe, has to come from flaunting your failures, achieving that state of humility of like, wow, we really are all the same. So all I can do is better than I was. Be better than I was at my emotional and sobriety. Be better behaviorally. Um, be kinder to people. Be more thoughtful, less self-centered. And just approach everything in action, taking a leap, being super aware of where I need to take that leap and just going for it. And whoever you need help to help you, ask them for help. There's a reason we're not alone on the planet, everyone. Yep, exactly. We're not supposed to do it alone. No, we're not. And we look at, you know, even our bodies, right? So our bodies, and maybe you'll appreciate this, they're individual cells working toward one greater purpose, right? And the greater purpose is to keep us alive and healthy. Um, if one of those cells decided, you know what, I don't need you guys. And then maybe a couple others joined. We could have some problems, right? Maybe autoimmune disease or something like that uh, could happen. So just as our bodies work as one unit, so we should work as a collective. And that's the power of, you know, coming together. That's the power of uh, of collaboration over competition. Because singularly, we're pretty good by ourselves, but we're really great when we work together. And regardless of who you are or what your goals are, I think that builds confidence too, because all of a sudden you're not so alone in this world anymore. And you're finding your tribe and you're leaning into your strengths and you don't have to do all the things because you have a team of people around you that want the best for you and are supporting you. It's pretty powerful. And that goes back to that environment we talked about too, right? Yeah. Well, you're going to be creating a new environment when you tell people what your intention is. People will instantly be on their best behavior when you tell people that you're going to be on your best behavior. Ooh. So if you're, you know, starting a conference or you're, you're leading a team or something, it's like, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to announce what I'm going to do. And then everybody will, everybody will just sit up straight. In fact, there was a teacher that um, did a study just in their own class. And it was telling the kids, show me, show me what it means to be a good student. And they all went, they sat up straight. They were focused, head straight like this right? And everybody was fully paying attention, which brings me to this conclusion that if we all instinctively know what good behavior is as a human, if we all know that being kind and thoughtful and honest, all those things, if we all know that that's quote good behavior. We have to know that we're not in good behavior <laughs> in order to make that shift, right? So like if you're if you're yelling at your wife or your husband and then somebody walks in the door, you're going to snap straight. Well, why can't we just do that right in the before you're being witnessed? Right? Or if you're driving in your car like you're speeding like crazy and you see a cop, why do you instantly know to slow down? So we don't just intuitively and naturally as a default do things that are safest for us or do things that are actually healthy for us. 
we do all the things but that. And then when we're called on it, we can shape up. Just find that area where you were talking about, like, how do we take action over this? How do we make the change? Well, we would have to recognize wing versus what we would do if we were being observed and do that. Yes. Just be that person and practice being that person every chance you get. And this is what I say to my students. If you are in emotional sobriety training, you never come home from the gym. You're always training. I think about emotional sobriety when I'm in the shower, when I'm driving my car, when I'm talking to my husband, when I'm parenting. I think about it when I'm with my patients. It's always there. Right? Yeah. Surround yourself in your mind's eye with the people that you respect the most and pretend they're always observing you. Yes. And I like that approach because honestly, that's that's the honest approach. A lot of people are looking for a quick fix. A lot of people just want the one answer and they want to have a checkbox and say, okay, I'm ready. I'm done. I've done all the checkies. Well, in reality, it's a lifestyle change, a lifestyle change. And I wish, I wish, I wish I could say, you know what? You can check your box on action. You're done. But I can't, right? And neither can you. We can't say these things because it's a lifestyle commitment. And it's something we do think about every day. The good news is that while it is a marathon, not a sprint, oh, is it a rewarding marathon? And the thing of it is that there is no destination. It's the journey of it. And it's growing continuously. And then looking back on the past and saying, man, how far did I come? That's great. Yeah. And not, not looking back at the past and saying, you know what? I'm not, I haven't changed much. Ouch. I don't want that to happen to me. I don't think anybody who's listening wants that to happen to them either. We, we want to keep going. We want to progress. And if, if, if we feel like we're in a spot right now where we're not, we're just not where we want to be. And maybe we're drunk on emotion, right? Or making a lot of emotional decisions and emotional reactions to things. I promise it's holding us back and we can change it. Just know that it's a lifelong commitment and that's a good thing. It's a and, you're gonna, and you're going to have massive change in there. It's not like you have to wait to the end of your life. I mean, one yeah. week, one, three days or a week into emotional sobriety training, people are like, I'm a different person. My yeah. life is going to be different. So just know that you're going to take quantum leaps in your process when you really take action. And what you said earlier, it's like people just want to be able to check it off and be done with it because we're inherently lazy. Yeah. I mean, we really are. We, we're yeah. looking for the path of least resistance. Was, here's the thing. We're not lazy in everywhere in life. Yeah. We're lazy around certain areas of growth because we already work our butts off. We're working so hard to make money, to make our life work. We're working hard in our relationships, even though we're really not maybe doing it in the most effective ways, but we're just spinning our wheels and blowing energy out. And so, yeah, we don't have any more energy to give. And so I want to help people recognize that you can conserve energy and bring that energy back to you when you become emotionally sober. Because you have no idea how much energy you're dispersing in the falsehood that you believe and the emotional state that you continue to make. You're constantly, it's like drinking all day. You think someone that drinks all day feels good? No. Somebody that has anxiety and depression and is offended and angry and embarrassed all day and has shame, they're also, they're hung over the next morning because they're been intoxicated all day. So I like what you said about how people want to just check off a box because we really are looking for the path of least resistance. And when you can recognize that the only resistance is you. Mm. So every path you look at is going to present as a path of resistance because you don't want to engage it. But on the other side of your resistance is the new you. And it's literally that fast. It's that fast. Yes. Amen to that. You no, know, so many people uh, reach out to me. You know, I, I wrote my book and my, my rock bottom point was in March of 2022. And they say, what I did is not possible. And I challenge them and I, it, these quantum leaps you're talking about, right? Um, and we see this in nature. A 
caterpillar literally transforming into a butterfly. And it's not years. It doesn't happen in years, straight. The caterpillar is not marinating in that cocoon for years. This is a couple days process, and boom, it's a completely different thing. It's unrecognizable. The same exact principle can be put on us as human beings, and we can literally transform. When I look at pictures from two years ago, I may have been younger then. I look better now. So it also, not only does it cause you to show up in the world differently, it increases your success. It makes you a better leader, friend, mom, husband, whatever. But it also causes you to look differently sometimes too. Oh, yes. Which is, I wasn't expecting that. I look completely different. Yep. You look completely different, don't you? You're a completely different person. Yeah. And it's possible for anybody. It's true. And in fact, my husband and I, we do three to five day events where people completely transform in that time. Wow. And and it's sustainable. This is the thing because we leave you with the tools and the handholding and the guidance if you need it to sustain that forever. And not only that, but to keep it, like advancing it mm. because it doesn't take a lot. It's when you simplify change. Any problem has a solution. Yeah. Right? It's just, it's a formula. I'm just waiting for your TED, TEDx talk. Uh, when, oh. you know, I can't wait for that because that'll be a good one. I the world, needs, the world needs to hear this information, right? They need to hear that we're drunk on emotion because I had never heard that before until I met you. And when you're saying this, it all makes so much sense because it is real. This is the solution, right? It's this emotional intelligence training we're talking about. So much of our heartaches and hardships are from past events that we're drunk on and we can't stop thinking about. And if you are suffering from depression and anxiety and we have ruminating thoughts, again, it's marinating. You're basting your brain in these negative thoughts and emotions. And then we take those thoughts and emotions, these things, and it causes up us to show up differently in our present realities. Yeah. It causes our environment, right? And the relationships we're in, the jobs we have, the people we talk to. Because it is a, game, a total game changer. I went from having this limiting belief of I don't deserve love. Right? Which was holding me back in every aspect of my life. To no, oh yes I do. So does, so does the other people, so do other people around me. And then I'm going to take this now and I'm going to start showing up differently. So if I got rejected in the past, you know what? I used to go, kind of go into a little cocoon, a little cave. Oh, I'm rejected. I don't deserve love. That's another re, re uh, you know, uh, yep, yep. That's true. It must be true to now you'll, maybe you'll appreciate this. If I get rejected, I say to myself, it's only because I didn't ask for more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Changes awesome. the game a little bit, right? Totally does because what we truly believe will be evidenced in our life. So, for example, if you feel you don't deserve love, you're going to find proof of it everywhere. You're going to have relationships that you yes. drive away because of that belief. And so it's like they say a self-fulfilling prophecy. I used to hate that, by the way. They say, I'm not not purposefully doing anything. It's like not what we're saying. I'm saying all the things that you do that are emotionally triggered will give you your exact belief in reality. I'm so afraid I'm going to betray that I'm going to hyper attach to this person. I'm going to follow them around. I'm going to check their emails. I'm going to check their text messages. I'm going to get super jealous. I'm going to be hysterical. And then guess what happens? They're going to be pushed away from you and they're going to end up feeling something for someone else or right. So you're saying, see, I knew you'd betray me, but did you not help create that? Now I'm not saying it's anyone's fault that they get cheated on or whatever. I'm saying it's our responsibility to look for where our insobriety contributes to our problems. Exactly. Exactly. And I say total humility Cause I've been on all sides of that. I've been on all of them. I've been the person that 
was has betrayed other people and I've been the person that's been betrayed. So it's like, I get it. I understand all the sides. I'm not speaking from a soapbox here. This is all coming from recognizing when we remain victims, mm-hmm. we make more victims. Yes, yes. I always say we can either be the victim or the victor. We got to choose, wow. right? Yeah, it's always a wow. So much wisdom here. Gosh, uh, I already want you back in another episode um, because, you know, this ownership is something I'm very passionate about, right? And a lot of people, you know, when they are searching uh, for, you know, who's the best version of myself, what does that mean? How can I become more confident? How can I develop as a person and a human being? One of the main things they're not taking care into account is this responsibility and ownership but the good news is is that when we do take responsibility and ownership it's so empowering because we realize we are the masters of our own destiny and that we can actually change um and it's giving the power back to where it belongs which is each of us so love that thank you so much for enlightening us today um and especially the part about a total transformation because it is possible. And it, again, it's, it can be very quick, right? It's a, it's a long game. It's something that we're always working towards because there is no final stop. It's, it's about doing quantum leaps and about improving them every single day after that. And doing that on a continual basis to when you feel so good about yourself and the circle around yourself only uplifts you. And you find friends and your tribe and things just start to click. And it's all because we did what? Took care of ourselves first and addressed things that were holding us back. So empowering. Yes. It's addition by subtraction. Addition by subtraction is something my husband says all the time. It's like finding who you know you don't want to be instead of trying to make somebody you want to be. So first start with. The things that you know are limiting you, the limiting beliefs, the metabolic disruptors, all the things we can teach you on that. But I want you to recognize that it's when you remove something, it, it's just a decision to do it. It's a, it's a decision and a decision takes that long. It's that fast. You right now, like you haven't had coffee on this phone call, right? So you're, you're yeah. right. So let's say you drink coffee every day, all day, but you haven't had coffee off this phone call. So one of the things my husband might say is, well, you're, you have a, you're off coffee. You literally never have to drink it again. So it's in that moment. I haven't fought. I haven't fought with my partner today. I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore. Okay. Wow. It's once you've removed it and decided you added energy back to your life. Yeah. Added energy back to your life that will help you transform. And I mean, here's an example of that. I was working with a CEO of a very, very big corporation, and he was really struggling in his life. And when I met him, it was like lots of drugs, alcohol, compulsive behaviors, um, really, really negative, like really bad anxiety, really negative thoughts, a lot of problems. And a couple of days into our working together, his little daughter walked up to him and said, Daddy, you look different. Hmm. It's that fast. Yeah. Just emotionally, like hadn't even taken out all of his negative things yet, you know, but just changing the way he was thinking was changing the way he was appearing and therefore eventually changing his leadership as well. Yes. That's so Full true. Turnaround. Full turnaround. And I, I think that's true with gratitude as well. You can't fake being grateful um, because it's an energy. It's a vibration. Um, and it's not a thought. It's not a thought. And I think people that do practice gratitude, they do look different. It's almost like they're shining, right? It's just so the light. Yeah. They are. They're shining a light. It's permeating out of their pores, it seems. And um, you can't fake that. And it's certainly not something you can check a box and say i'm done right okay i'm grateful for my car i'm grateful for my house yeah that's it doesn't work it does not thank you so much for having me it was lovely and 
if people haven't watched your TED talk yet, they should, because that was a really good one. <laughs> Thank you so much. But tell us how, what's the best way to get a hold of you and how can people work with you and find you? Oh, um, a really cool way is you can take a quiz that I designed to help you find your behaviors, your emotionally triggered behaviors, and you can go to liftedacademy.com forward slash remodel. All right. Well, I'm, I know what I'm doing after this. I'm going to take that quiz. <laughs> also, um, you can email me directly if you have any questions, Andrea at liftedacademy.com. I always answer my emails. I got you. Liftedacademy.com. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being a guest today. And thank you so much for everyone who tuned into the show. Don't forget to share this with your networks. Don't forget to like and subscribe. This show continues and grows because of our listeners. So we need your support in growing this show so we can help more people develop and become the best versions of themselves. Thank you so much, and we will catch you all on the next episode. Take care. And that's a wrap for this episode of Grasp Confidence. Thank you for joining me today and investing in yourself. Remember, building confidence is an ongoing journey, and each step you take brings you closer to the empowered, fearless version of yourself that you were born to be. Don't forget to visit my website, follow me on social media, and purchase my book, which is available on Amazon. Thank you for listening. We will see you on the next episode. Stay confident.